All right. Hello, hello, everybody. Welcome back to another edition of the One Up Sales Development Podcast. For to my next guest that I got on today, it's someone truly, really special. It's funny because I listened to this person's episode with David Delaney on the Sales Development Podcast many, 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 many times, and his voice—he has a distinct voice. You can recognize him exactly who he is, where he's at. So this individual is coming through hot. He is a sales development leader. He's been in a SDR manager role for about, I would say, five plus years now. He is from the front lines, for the front line. He started out as an SDR himself. He worked his way up the ranks. He also is an author of Code to Commit It. He is the SDR manager. He has his own blog too as well. Please give us a warm welcome to Mr. Not the one and only, Mr. Kyle Van Boris, SDR manager at Bloom Globo. Hello, hello. Oh, please hold the hold the applause. <laughs> Just a normal guy. Kyle, thank you again so much for having on this uh, episode with us at the One Up Sales Development Podcast. You really, your your works is very. I have a lot to say. Thanks for it, and and reason I say is because I've been following you for quite some time now. Not only that, it's that when I, when I created a thread and when I reached out to help, you were very, very, very helpful. You actually helped me several times on a personal level that you know it's for another conversation for the day which actually was very 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 uh thoughtful and very um i'm very appreciative of that because we actually you know t- implement what you what you taught and gave you back so welcome to the one up sales development podcast <laughs> yeah i'm excited to be here happy to help in any time so uh this is great yeah so kyle without further ado for our audience who's listening today why don't you go ahead and just take it away give us a brief uh, introduction of who you are currently, what you do, and how did you end up in sales development? So, um, <clears throat> I mean, we could start from the beginning, <laughs> if you, uh, a little please. bit about who I am. So, I, um, I've i built and scaled multiple inside sales, SDR teams, whatever you want to call them, BDRs, and I've done it very successfully, <laughs> uh, both times that uh, I've had to start from scratch. they turned into really great high producing teams and I absolutely love the world of sales development and I can talk a little bit about why so I started in sales development in 2014 2013 around there as a, an, an SDR at um, uh, Intuit specifically a company called Demand Force that was acquired by Intuit uh, before I went there. So um, I know there's a lot of people in the Demand Force uh, world, or at least who were part of that company beforehand. So they can speak to some of the experience, but it was a really, really aggressive environment. It's a lot of cold calls, almost no email at all. And it was just dialing for dollars, handing off to the account executives that were either going to close a deal or not. And we were compensated when the deal closed. So it was this really, really tough environment, but they did a lot of training and they provided a lot of resources. So as long as you took advantage of everything and you had enough grit to make it through, like you really were set up for success, not only in that role, but also in uh, an account executive role and whatever you choose to pursue moving forward. So that was my first taste of the SDR world. I got promoted to an account executive there. I did that for, I think, two years. And um, <clears throat> after after that, I decided to write the book, Cold to Committed. So wow. I wrote that book um, a few years back. I ended up rewriting it, I think, last year. And um, it was an Amazon bestseller. It's done really well. A lot of people have gotten value from it, which is great. And it's just my account. It's things that have worked for me and the teams I've built and um, hopefully will work for anyone who reads it. Uh, I often say there's no one right way of doing anything. Everyone who gives sales advice, they might give a little bit of a different advice and it works for them. But then the other advice works for someone else, right? So it really depends on the person more than it is the piece of advice. And we could talk about endless examples of that. But ultimately, at the end of the day, in sales development, in sales, I would argue even in, in life and in most career choices, it's the individual that's responsible for getting the result. How you go about getting that result is going to be different. But as long as the result is met, that's what's important. Um, so that's why I'm passionate about sales development. I have a background in it. I wrote a book on it. I've been really successful at building those teams. Um, it's honestly just what I'm good at. So if it's not broke, <laughs> it. Oh my God. I love that. Um, Kyle, so please tell me about your book, Call to Committed. So there's a lot of individuals out there who has a passion, right? They go out there, they do what they love. They're really good at it, but it only takes a specific percentage of that person to actually say, you know what, 
I want to write a book. But then again, out of that percentage, just takes another percentage to go, you know what? I will write the book and you actually get you started. Yep. So how, what, what got the ball rolling for you to actually take action, get that started with Cold to Committed? Uh, because I said I would. <laughs> it's really like what it comes down to is um, if I say I'm going to do something, I'm going to do it. I mean, that's just at the end of the day, that's who I am as a person. And um, the, I really liked the idea of writing the book for a couple of reasons. One is because I think I had some good advice and um, yeah. a book is a good medium for giving good advice. So I wanted to put it out for that reason. And then the other reason was it was very unlikely that I would write a book. I dropped out of college to pursue stand-up comedy when I was really young, um, when I was in college, obviously, <laughs> as far as really young is. And, um, you know, and, and that was always like this blemish on my resume where, you know, where's your, your degree? Oh. Like, well, I don't yeah. have one. And, um, when when I thought about writing the book, I was like, well, people without degrees don't really write books yet. And then so I went and decided to write the book. And obviously that's not oh. true. There's a lot of great, great leaders out there who'd never had a college degree and who wrote great books that are really powerful and meaningful. And I don't think I stand on the same podium as them at all. But that was inspirational is, hey, even if you don't have this formal education, let's put words on paper and if those words inspire action and that action leads to something good, then it was worth writing the piece in the first place. So that's really what motivated the book writing. And uh, fortunately, I think it's, it's done a lot of good for the people who've read it and implemented some of the stuff I talk about. Oh, wow. Okay. 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 I, Kyle, I love that. You know, um, writing a book, like you mentioned, is a great way to get your name out there, right? Especially you know, if you have something to give and share to the world in terms of best practices and something that they can take action on and really do it on their end, then that's when it becomes valuable. But what really uh, got me spotted too, like you mentioned, so you dropped out of college to pursue uh, comedy. Was this before, was this like in year one, year two? What, what happened there during the school? So it was probably yeah. year two of community college. But to be clear, it wasn't like I was good at school, right? So <laughs> I, I, don't want, I don't want anyone to think like, wow, he really you know, took a risk. It's like I wasn't doing well. Um, I yeah. didn't like it. I was doing stand-up comedy um, in the evenings. I was going just going to class, and going is a really, really polite way of saying it. I mean, I was a body in the seat, but my head was you know, in the sky. And uh, um, <clears throat> I was also working at a gym, a crunch fitness, and I was selling oh, yeah. gym memberships and I was, I was good at it. I was actually really good at selling gym memberships. And what ended up happening was, um, <clears throat> I was getting to a point where I was actually making okay money. You know, it wasn't great, but I was still living at home at the time and I was not doing well in any of my classes. So I was like, why am I even doing this? So I just stopped. My parents flipped out and, um, <clears throat> I just, didn't sign up for the next semester. It gave me way more time to work on my comedy. I've performed at Cobb's, Punchline, the comedy store in LA, right? That's oh. down over, down south by you. And yeah. um, I really loved it. <clears throat> but while I was going through this experience, um, some of my, the leadership at the Crunch Fitness I worked at actually got hired at into it. So they oh. referred me because I did well there. And into it overlooked that I didn't have a degree because I had a good referral and they made me do a mock cold call and it went well. So they were like, yeah, throw them on board and let's see what happens. Wow. Okay. Okay. Um, so first things first, if you can't break it down for our audience here, what, what is into yeah. it? Uh, they make QuickBooks, TurboTax. Um, the gotcha. specific oh, business of course. I was in was – into yeah, it. <laughs> the specific uh, business unit I was in was Demand for, so that was a company they acquired before I was there. Yeah, got They're it. Okay, company. okay, let's let, let's dive a little bit deeper into this because I, I I love it when it comes to this situation because there's a lot of people out there, you know, companies would always say no matter what, hey, this is the bare minimum. You gotta have an undergrad. You gotta have an undergrad, BS, BA degree. You gotta have a degree. But yep. like you are just one of many in there that shows people you don't have to have a degree to be successful in life. You really got to just find what you're good at, become truly valuable at it, doing something that well, not everyone can offer and be known for it. And then really uh, you know, become valuable and to the point where you can make it happen. And I think you are a great example of what, what you're doing today. I mean, not saying that college is not something that they shouldn't do or proceed or take, you know, um, but you really met like a really good person to show and say, Hey, you're a good example. Like, you don't. You should go to school, try college, and try it out. But if, if if you don't end up finishing, 
it's not the end of the world. And Kyle Van Vorm is a great example of that. Yeah, I mean, I hope so. But I, I also, <laughs> I would also suggest everyone go to college. Yeah, you know, I actually yeah. am a huge advocate for college. If my kids didn't go to college, I would be disappointed. Like I want them to have a strong education. I'm a unique case and it's not lost on me that that's true. Um, <clears throat> I happened that, yeah, I didn't do well in school, but I also happened to have a very strong work ethic, which typically doesn't, that's typically not the same person, right? Usually someone who doesn't do well in school doesn't have a strong work ethic, but I was so afraid of failing um, at everything but school, like school, I didn't care about it all for some reason, but in every other aspect of my life, like I just didn't want to let people down. So when I was working at crunch fitness, I would work incredibly hard. I was always the first one in and I was just selling gym memberships. Like most people don't care about that kind of job, but, um, I really tr took it very seriously. And that's just not normal. And most people drop out of college because they don't have the work ethic. And that's why companies use it. Right. Um, I, I've interviewed people who don't have a college degree and I've not hired them. And it's not because they don't have a college degree, it's just the lack of a college degree. And then what I saw in the interview made me lead to that decision that mm, I don't know if this is going to be the right fit here. So I am a strong advocate for school. I actually go to school part-time now and I'm nice. working through getting my degree now. And listen, do I wish that if I could go back, would I, would I do it all? No, probably not. Cause I'd be in a totally different place. Um, I like the path I took. It is harder. It is harder. I'm not, I, trust me, if I put my resume through any large company, it's going to get rejected immediately because of lack of degree when those large companies would be crazy not to hire me. So right, right. you have to, you know, you have to balance pros and cons. For me, it worked out. Yeah. And I'm really happy to hear and see that too. You know, I'm a big fan of you and your work, Kyle, especially everything well, that you, you do comes to the blog, your article, and even your book. When you just mentioned, I was like, you know what? It's on uh, Amazon. Um, is it? Is it only on eBooks? Only just or, or no? No, no. It's that? a physical book. Oh, yeah. is there? It's somewhere on this bookshelf. Yeah. <laughs> gotcha. Okay, I gotta double check on that too, because I, I I prefer having books like physically. Uh, but I think I bought the oh, yeah. that from your end. But I read it. I was like, oh, it's not bad. I don't know what he's doing. <laughs> <laughs> I know a thing or two. <laughs> yeah, Kyle. Um, so I, I wanna I wanted to dive a little bit deeper. Let's talk about your your, your comedy thing. How how did that happen? Were you always a Dave Chappelle fan? Were you were you always the funny guy in the group? You're always making people laugh. How, 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 yeah. What did you think that route, man? <laughs> well, I, I told my first joke at um at fi on in front of an audience in fifth grade, and um it's a funny story. <clears throat> I was in science class. I remember the joke. This is the first joke I told in front of a crowd. <laughs> oh, class the teacher is explaining different tools used in the lab and she pulls up this graduated cylinder you know those long cylinders that you pour uh, liquid into yeah, and yeah, she yeah. says class this is a graduated cylinder and I raised my hand in the back of the class fifth grader and she said yeah Kyle what's your question and I said what college did it graduate from and I got a huge <laughs> laugh I got a huge laugh and, and from that moment I knew the stage is where I needed to be. And it's kind of a cool story. I, um, I went to high school or middle school after that. I was always involved in theater. In high school, I was very active in theater. Um, I was the first sophomore to be accepted into the most advanced drama class. I was drama club president. Like I was very, very involved. I did a lot of improv and I liked acting a lot. I liked improv more. And I was also pretty funny. I was pretty funny. Um, <clears throat> you know, some of my stand up from back then is probably cringy to watch now, but I was okay. I was okay. So when I was in high school, when I turned 17 years old, that's when the comedy club would let me do an open mic night that was in Pleasanton. And uh, I did my first open mic night and I just, I loved it. So I, I oh, at nice. 17 years old, I kind of ran around and did stand up and it was always something I did on the side and then through college and then you know, eventually <clears throat> when I was going through the work world and I was an SDR and then an account executive, you have a choice to make. You can be a broke comedian for 13 years and maybe make it, or you can make money, have a family. <laughs> and that aligned with more of you know, what I visualize my future as, but um, I'll, I'll hop on stage again one day. It'll be when I'm older and more financially secure, but I'll eventually get, get back on stage. Oh, nice. Okay. So that, that's your passion and dream you know, going out, you know, it, it, it takes a lot of, um, it takes a lot of guts for people to really go out there and just stand in front of a crowd, even if you're telling a jokes or maybe yeah. a speech or just sharing a class, uh, in-person presentation. Like what, what are a few things that you took to 
overcome those kind of obstacles and really just be like, you know what? I'm going to go on stage and not seem nervous and I'm just going to make it happen. Was there like breathing techniques going on? Is there a preparation notes yeah. in your back book or what does that look like to you? No, I mean, everything's written before you go up there. So that's helpful. But same with the uh, cold calling. I mean, it's really, it's really applicable when you're uh, making cold calls, which is when I'm on, when I'm on stage, that's where I am. There's nothing else in my head. I barely even see an audience. And it's because I, for me, in that moment, I'm in this super focused, this state of Zen. It's the only time where my mind is perfectly clear. Now, if you can achieve that level of flow or whatever you want to call it, magic, <laughs> on a cold call, you'll be a wizard. You, you know, you'll be able to book any meeting that comes, your, that, that comes across your phone. And the trick, in my opinion, <clears throat> is to separate yourself from the other person. And you can't do it fully. So on, the, on a cold call, for example, you got to separate yourself from a prospect. Doing stand-up comedy, you have to separate yourself from the audience. But they're always going to influence you. But I can separate myself from the If a joke doesn't land, the next joke I'm still saying with the same vibrato as the joke before that failed. And I, wow. and I can and I have before won a crowd back over. Same thing on a cold call. Right now, it's less forgiving in some ways. You know, there, people aren't drinking, for example. I mean, if they were, maybe we'd, <laughs> we'd all hit quota. But um, uh, the important thing to think of is uh, for, for everybody, you know, especially if you get nervous on the phone, is to disconnect yourself from the person you're speaking with. Like a, an example I'll give a lot of people or an a exercise I'll give a lot of SDRs is – make calls without looking at the title or the name of the person until they answer the phone. Nice. What are we looking at people's, what are we looking at people's titles for? Does it matter? They're on our list that we're giving them a call regardless of their title. Knowing it beforehand doesn't help you. And when the phone is ringing, look at the guy or girl and say, Hey, what's your, what's this person's name and title? All right, now I'll talk to him and just separate yourself from the like, people get so worked up before they even make a phone call. So I prefer like flip it and just like, why don't we just call and then figure out what we're doing? <laughs> oh, <laughs> you know, be wow. forced to be put on the spot. Okay. Okay. A few things. Sir. I, I, I love that. So, and this is coming from you as an SDR manager who experienced this from time to time. And I would uh, assume that, you know, SDR and BDRs are typically really young faced, right? They just yeah. you know, fresh out of college and stuff like that. Right. They're calling right. on VPs and directors, 10 plus years of sales experience, and they never sold in their entire life. And hopping on a call, they're speaking to these people that are like highly tenured, and then they would get like yep. these butterflies. And when they actually get connected with like an executive of Sound Deep, it was like, hello, or hello, this is Bob. And they're like, oh, damn, like, oh my God, uh, uh, hello, hello, and get shy. And then you right there just really telling them, hey, you know, don't worry about the title. Why don't we just go ahead and make that mental switch in terms of just doing the opposite. So then that way, when they pick up the phone, it's like, Hey, how's it going? Da, 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 whatever. And then they just look over and then like, okay, now I know who I'm talking about. So they won't get worried ahead of time. Is that, is that what it is? I think so. So I look and people are going to debate like crazy on this. <clears throat> um, yeah. Oh, well, if I don't know their title, you know, I won't know how to position the thing. Like, you know how to position the product to the title instantaneously like you don't need to prep if you can't if you can't tailor your the value prop of your solution like that based on someone's title if you can't shake someone's hand or i guess we don't do that anymore if you can't wave to a prospect <laughs> and <laughs> you can't if you can't wave to a prospect and then say i'm the ceo and then you know what value prop to give come on like, then we need to go back to onboarding and we need to make sure that your company is giving you the resources you need to be successful um everyone should be able to do it the truth is a lot of times you read the title you you'll do research SDRs will do a bunch of this research and none of it comes up on the cold call basically none of it and sometimes there's an anecdotal piece of evidence that says like oh thank god i did that research and it gets into what's called re results oriented thinking which sounds super good Oh, I'm results oriented in my thinking. It's actually kind of bad in a lot of cases, or at least in the world of cold calling. And the reason why is because you start thinking that something that worked this one time will work again. And it was the right way to do something. Oh, Sometimes the wow. wrong way to do something works. 
Yeah. It doesn't work a high enough percentage of the time for it to be worth doing. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Um, so like for instance, like we know, we know for a fact what works for someone won't always work across the board depending sure. who they're speaking to, right? Because some are more receptive towards email. Some are more receptive through LinkedIn, maybe Twitter. Well, that's just another bump, but some, some preferred a phone call. <clears throat> and, and, and just based on what you just told me, I would, I would imagine probably they were like, do research on, oh, they did this and that, X, Y, Z, and then they bring it up to the company. Hey, Cal, I did research on one, two, three. And then was that relevant to you? And the answer would probably, you know, when someone was yes. Is that, is that correct? Yeah. And I actually want to challenge something you said, yeah. which is the method of communication the prospect prefers. We talk about this a lot and I agree and disagree at the same time. The prospect's going to have a method of communication they prefer. They might prefer you email them, but that doesn't mean that's how you're getting the meeting. So just because they don't prefer to be cold called doesn't mean cold calling isn't the right thing to do. And that's a very important distinction to make because oftentimes I see people getting caught in this trap of trying all of these different methods to see which one the person prefers. And then they save the calling to the very end, which is the quickest. It is so fast when you get someone on the phone, you get instant okay. feedback. So why not just call them first? Yes. 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 Okay. Kyle, I, um, I want to piggyback on this. I am. I'm just like you. If it, if it came down to one channel specific choice for me, it would be the phone. And I imagine that's just like for you too. And even though it is the oldest and the first technology that was ever brought in the world, it is, I would still say still the most effective today. We just got to ask them the right questions and asking for permission, just disarming them. And I, I really believe some SDRs and BDRs out there. And I'm, I'm sure you would agree too, because they they would they would not prefer the phone. Therefore, they said, you know what? Let me try and see how this guy do it. And 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 then what happens is that they try to make a point out of it and to make a result and to put in a memos and be like this person rather commute through email when really in fact they're just scared of the phone themselves. Yeah, hundred percent. That's a hundred percent true. And wow. the the phone works. I get it's inefficient, but we try to pretend like the SDR role is efficient. It's not. If you're tailoring every email you're sending out, you're still, your response rates are still low. Like yeah. we're, we're almost trading, we're, we're trading like in, inefficiency on clicking a phone call and trying to talk to people for doing research and using a like, oh, your college sports team did well last week, you know, and, and I get it. And I do think, don't, don't, I don't want people to misunderstand me. I do think it's valuable researching customized your emails. Like I think all of that is valuable, but I also believe that you need to use the phone. And yeah. I, I think it's underutilized. I mean, I'm very confident it's underutilized, but um, I think if people were to use it a little bit more and especially as like a first touch, like let's just try to get somebody on the phone here. I think they would be pretty impressed by the results. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree. So Kyle, let's, 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 let's dive into this. So there's a lot of, and it's going to be ongoing for those who listen to it, especially the new and young SDR and BDRs. They're going to be phone shy straight off the bat. Like mm -hmm. in your experience, what, what kind of methodology do you believe that that's best and just really sit down and how, get, get them bought in with that process? Like what, in your experience, what, what do you find working when it comes throwing to- Throwing them in. Throw, throw you in that's the what right? I do with everybody. Just throw them in. Because here's the deal. You're never going to be 100% comfortable at cold calling. Never. I could pick up the phone right now. I'll do a good job. But you think I'm 100% comfortable? No, I'm calling yeah. some stranger out of nowhere. Right? <laughs> you, know, you, you almost never get to a point of 100% comfortability. You know, it's not the same as sitting on the couch. But <clears throat> when you have the repetitions, yeah. it's not scary anymore. And then on top of that, the other big lever you have to pull is tone. So if I'm a brand new SDR, I'm working on tone of voice is my number one thing. How do I sound on the phone? That's your biggest lever. It's even more important than script, I think. It, maybe it's debatable, but I, I would argue that tone of voice, if you look at the best SDRs, like people who are just unbelievable, they sound really good on the phone. Really good. Yes. That's your biggest lever. And then yes. after that... <clears throat> It's the script. It's all of these other things. Yes. 
tonability, really, really, really important, right? Like you're calling someone out, that's the first thing they hear. Um, and like Alan D. Hollis said, uh, we, we had a conversation a while back too. He says like the first thing they hear is like a punch in the face. You know, you really got to say, hey, Kyle, it's Jackson here with 10 down. Did I catch it a good time? And you really got to just have that voice, right? So let's talk about tonability and really able to match. So this is a big topic too when it comes to cold calling Kyle, right? Um, tonability is one thing. How do you sound? What are you saying? And what are you trying to do? But it's also if when they respond, you really want to match their voice if they're talking low, you talk low, if they're talking high, we talk high. What, what are your thoughts on that? So I think it's very easy to over-optimize this kind of stuff. Yeah. I personally, one, my tone is kind of hard to change. I sound like this regardless of what I do. Yeah. And it's funny. <laughs> when I, I was, uh, this, well, this is a funny story. Uh, when I started as an SDR, I was cold calling salons and spas. So imagine you're working in a salon, like it was primarily female owners of these salons, and they were actively cutting someone's hair when I called them. And this is the voice they get. I'm sorry, we can do better, folks. <laughs> <You know? laughs> but, um, <clears throat> but here's the deal. So tone is really important. I'm less worried about matching the tone of the other person. And I'm more worried about matching the tone of what you're saying, like the spirit of what you're saying. If you're talking about something that's concerning or if you're giving a case, if you're verbally giving a case study, like we work with somebody and originally they were having this challenge, changing your tone for when you're talking about the challenges makes a lot of sense. And then having enthusiasm, and this is so funny. I, I have a weekly newsletter. I actually think uh, you're on it. I think you told me you yeah, signed yes, up I for am. it. But uh, if is. you read my my newsletter, I think it was last week. It might have been, oh, maybe it was the week before. I actually talk about enthusiasm. Yeah. And enthusiasm is so important in sales, but especially uh, getting cold called. Like I had heard so many cold calls. You can get my cell phone number on all of these platforms. Like it, I don't, well, whoever you're using for data, they have my cell phone. I don't get very many cold calls because everyone's afraid. But if, <laughs> when, when someone cold calls me, I immediately know if they're good or not, just from how enthusiastic they sound, just what their tone of voice is. And if they sound good, they have my, they have my attention. Wow. Okay. I, I love that. And I, I would say because you had an SDR manager, you're, you came from the front line and you know who's good or not. And if they really deserve it, you, you would really just give them a shot and give them a piece of your time. Is that what it is? Yeah. I mean, I, I also want to hear their strategy. Like maybe they have something good that I'd never considered before. I mean, that's look. So when it comes to sales development, especially this is probably true for broader sales, but especially sales development in my experience, you really, when they zig, you have to zag. So if everybody's sending a bunch of emails, then you should be cold calling like crazy. And then oh, vice wow. versa, right? Like, like for example, let me give you a great example. <clears throat> the um, emails, when you're sending out emails to people, everyone's talking about subject lines. Oh, what subject line is the best? Which have the best? open rate. Everyone's looking at data of subject lines. Well, you, there's one big problem with looking at your subject line data. It's only the data on the subject lines you've tried. So ah, we can optimize yes. based on our own little box. But let me tell you something that's interesting. You want to know the subject line that I found to be the most successful today? Yes. Tell us, please. It is literally parentheses, no subject parentheses because that's if you don't put a subject line that's what google auto populates as the subject and people not only open it they respond to it they treat it like a normal email they don't think it's spam they oh, just wow. respond and it's totally it's my best performer today that doesn't mean it's going to be good after people listen to this and everyone starts using it right <laughs> but this is just an example when they zig you zag also, wow. try subject lines that are super, super short. You know, like if you're, if you're selling to, I don't know, if you're selling to sales teams, like a, a, a sales automation or something, some sales tool, right? If that's what you're selling, then yeah. use a subject line sales team. Like we, sometimes we just get so complicated with the things we do when it's like, why don't we strip it all away? Just say sales team. And if it kind of looks like an internal email, don't you think that someone's going to open it? Like you have to think of the person who's going to be consuming the email 
And if they just see the subject sales team, or if they see no subject, they're going to go, wait, what is this? Or, yeah. oh, sales team. I run a sales team. Click, open it. Yeah. Wow. Okay. <laughs> Kyle, I, I, I love that. I have never heard of that strategy that you said before. Well, I mean, I, I seen it been done. I'm talking about zigzag. You know, people zig and you zag. And it's just like breaking through the noise, right? Doing something that everyone else is not doing. You know, someone's doing all emails, you might as well shoot a video. If someone's not doing video, you might as well do a cold call. And I, I, I love that. Zigzag. So I, I want to talk about something real quick. Um, and I'm not sure. I, I think you probably know what it is. So whenever I get ready for a cold call, I like to go through what I like to call my mental switch. I hop in. Once I'm on the phone, I am dialed in. I don't, you know, I lock my doors. I put my card up. Don't touch me. Don't talk to me. Don't bother me. And one of it I use is sense. For instance, my lip I'm here. Um, I noticed you were doing that too. Do you do use the sense of power to do something like that? Or is that, or is that just doing your lip balm in general? Oh, 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 you said sense like, like uh, smells? Yeah. No, no, I don't. Um, no. Okay. No, no, I take that back. Because I noticed you were doing your lip balm earlier too. I thought you used like the sense of smell oh, every yeah, time you get ready for I mean, a podcast. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, I was, uh, before um, I was telling you, I like to cycle. And uh, my yeah. lips have been getting chapped lately. So yeah, I'm just. Putting, gotcha. uh, putting chapstick on. <laughs> gotcha. Okay. No, <laughs> I guess because I, I, I learned this like two years ago. There's this, are, are you familiar with some guy named Jordan Harbinger? He's like a big podcaster in San Francisco. Uh, he, yeah. It, uh, it's funny. I actually know him personally. He's a friend of mine. Are you serious? Yeah. Wow. Yeah, I okay. I, I love Jordan. I, I became a big fan of him about two years ago. This is right before um, when he was still at the Art of Charm, before that thing happened. Yeah. And one of my favorite episodes with him, he talked about uh, what some guy was about studying where you study for a test. And it, it, it's like a mental switch. You study at home, you study at a library. And one thing you can use is the sense of smell. And every time you just smell it, you're studying. So when you go to take it in right. class, you just use that smell and it'll trigger some kind of psychological event that will give you a back with that. Okay. Yeah. So I know that actually from, from Tony Robbins, um, I believe, I believe it's called anchoring. It's like an old NLP, which stands for neuro linguistic programming. It's like an old NLP uh, technique. And I believe it's oh. called anchoring. It's where you're, you do something repeatedly whenever you're in a specific state and then eventually it sort of programs your mind to when you do that thing, it's going to trigger you to be in the same physical state or mind state as yes. when you were doing it before. Um, this is also the same logic behind habit stacking. So I don't know if you've read any books on habits. Um, one of them that's really good is Atomic Habits. And um, they, there's a concept called habit stacking. So for example, everyone brushes their teeth at night or first thing in the morning, you brush your teeth. Well, what you can do, you already have the habit of brushing your teeth. You can actually stack another habit onto it. So oh. right after you brush your teeth, yet you then do this. And then after you do that and you build that habit, then after you brush your teeth, let's say after you brush your teeth, you read a book for 30 minutes, brush my teeth. Then I read a book for 30 minutes. That becomes your habit. Now wow. you're reading a book for 30 minutes every day, every time you brush your teeth. And then we can stack another habit and go for a 30 minute jog. So now brush your teeth, read a book for 30 minutes, go for a 30 minute jog. It's the same sort of idea where um, you're almost tying your, your tying mindset, I mean, even physical feeling to um, a particular action or like, you know, putting on chapstick or uh, another one's like squeezing your fingers um, or even to <laughs> other habits and you're linking them together. Wow. Okay. That's, that's amazing. So thank you for sharing that. I have never heard of that. So I'm going to have to take a stab at that. Um, I know for a fact, my routine is just for every time I wake up, I start out with like his most motivational speeches that I download on YouTube. So I have like hundreds of them and it just stretches you know Les Brown. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, Bach yeah. with a feathers flock together. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, um, I'm a big Les yes. Brown fan. I, I met him when I was a kid actually. And, no way. um, yeah, yeah. He's a, a great guy. And, um, one of my favorite speeches is him when he's talking about getting into the radio station and yeah. I don't know if you've heard this or not. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, everyone should go and watch this. <clears throat> if you type in uh less Brown, you gotta be hungry. It yep. is probably one of the best 
speeches I've ever heard. And if you haven't heard it, you should go listen to it. It's basically about his journey, um, trying to get a job at a radio station, yes. how he eventually gets that job, and then sort of the risks that he takes in order to put himself in a position and make his own luck in order to advance in that space. It's a very, very, very powerful story. Yes, yes. I, I know what you're talking about. I have that one downloaded too. Actually, no, not downloaded, but I heard it several times before. This is when he's, like you mentioned, he's trying to get, I think it was a limo driver uh, job or something, right? He kept walking in the office. Well, that's the first role that they gave him when he goes to the radio station. He had to, the guy said no to him like four times, five times. I mean, yeah. finally he says, go get me some coffee. Yes. And then his job was to drive, to pick up celebrities from the airport, drive them back to the radio station for the interviews. He didn't even have a driver's license. Anyway, yeah. it's a really powerful story. And everybody, if you look up Les Brown, you've got to be hungry. I'll actually probably do this week on my newsletter, I'll feature it. Because uh, I think it's such a powerful story. And I try to watch it often. And that's yeah. the one that I keep going back to. And it gets me so inspired. Yeah. It, it, I, to the best of my recollection, he goes in, he says something like, hey, I want to work for you. He said, get out of here. And he comes back, hey, yep. I want to get out of here. Get, get out of here. And he comes, hey, I want to work for you. Like, go grab me some coffee, right? He said, you got to be hungry. Yep. You got to be yep. hungry. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It is a great, a very powerful. And Les Brown is one of the best, for sure. Yeah, Kyle, I love that. You mentioned, you know, and you also mentioned um, habit stacking too, which uh, yeah. is funny because um, I'm a big Jim Brown fan too. I'm sure you know who that uh, is. Oh, yeah, you know? of course. You know, it's funny. My yeah. wall stack is uh, the more oh, there you, go. you started, right? But habits habits keep, keep going. going yeah i love that Cop, Cop, yeah. let's let's talk about your article and blog so you wrote a book sure. with, and i'm a big fan of your blog by the way uh, oh, happy, happy subscriber <laughs> <laughs> how did Lucky you start <laughs> hey so so talk to about your blog like how did you get started with that and then you really just got your own domain i'd imagine you just you took action to the point where you know what i want my own source of credibility in case someone wants to know who I am, I can redirect them to here and let me purchase this domain and just, you know, you have to like yeah. pay like a monthly website stuff in that too. Is that, mm -hmm. can you talk to us about yeah, that? Yeah, so, yeah, I can talk to you about that for sure. Um, so the first of all, the underbelly of all this is I really like writing. After writing my book and then rewriting it, if anyone read my first, the first version of my book and then the second version, two totally different books, literally word for word. I don't think there's any two words that are the same in the books. I just got so much better at writing after writing the first. And then when I reread the first one, I was like, okay, we need to, we need to fix some of this stuff. It didn't have much structure. So then I rewrote the whole thing. And through that process, I became um, really, really, I honestly just love writing. I really enjoy it. And um, so I wanted to write often and um, I wanted a domain to do it, like put it on a website um, and let people read it. Like it didn't, I mean, I guess I could post it on LinkedIn and stuff, but then, I don't know, it just it seemed like it got lost and I wanted a place that was mine and I could do with it, with it what I want and I could provide like more materials for people if they'll find it helpful. I have download links and stuff. Like I try to provide as much value as possible. And uh, so, yeah, I just bought, I bought the domain name. Um, I use Squarespace, it's super simple. Um, I've, I've done, I've built a lot of websites. So I actually used to run a, um, a, a content website. This was a, a while ago. Um, I had over 30 employees and we were getting close to a million views on the site uh, every wow. month. <clears throat> so I have, I have experience building websites are super simple, especially now with Squarespace and stuff. It's so easy. Back then it was a lot harder. Um, wow. So yeah, I just bought the domain name and now I just write, I, I write it, probably an article a week now. Sometimes yeah. I go on breaks, but. Okay. And if for our listeners here, if they, if they want to come in and say, Hey, you know what? I want to check it out. How do they, um, what's the, what's the domain for that? Uh, the, yeah, the domain, domain name is voris.com. So it's V as in Victor, O-U-R-I-S. Yeah. Um, it's the last five letters of my last name, uh, nice. .com. Nice, nice, nice. There it is, voris.com. <laughs> so, Kyle, um, I know we're running up the hour here too, and I really want to just knock down a few questions real quick just, for, just to get your thoughts on yeah, that. Yeah, of course. So you're a very well-known SDR manager, SDR leader in the sales space. You're credited. You've done the work. You know, you were rated at Inside Sales for 2017 top 25 sales development leader. In your eyes today, when it comes to sales development, what's broken? So that's, it's tough. Um, it really depends on the company. So it's hard to make blanket 
what's broken statements because every company has something different that's broken. Um, if I had to pin something down that comes up a lot and it's a little controversial is I, I do feel sometimes there's too much of an emphasis on customization and tailoring emails that go out to prospects. So we kind of touched on it earlier. Um, like I said, not something that's broken. Like I, th I see value in that and I do, and it definitely works. Like there's no doubt, but the amount of time that goes into customizing these emails sometimes gets way out of control. And wow. anybody who runs a, a, a company, any CEO, maybe even VPs of sales, they've seen this before, either early on while they were growing the company, maybe their first SDR teams, maybe even today they, they run into the challenge. It is very easy to get caught up in the customization cycle and spend way too much time way too much time <laughs> customizing so that's probably what comes up probably comes up the most would this be considered over personalization maybe i mean look <laughs> you're you're in the game you're in the game like what are you seeing when you go like, like sometimes it's great you know like yeah. for some industries i'm sure it's phenomenal because uh, like every vp of sales has written an article at this point Right. So if I'm going to tailor an email to a VP of sales, I'll just go read one of their articles and say, Hey, I love this part of your article. Like that makes so, so much sense to me. Right. That's valuable. Um, but a lot of times if, if you're not selling to salespeople or you're not selling to people who write content or, or they do blog posts or hop on podcasts, you're like going to their, you're just talking about their college. Like, does it take 30 minutes to write this? Like, no, it doesn't. But oh, we're like, man. sometimes people get caught in this trap where they're like searching and searching. Like, man, if I can just find oh. the one thing that I could tailor this email, this guy will surely respond. And then they don't respond and you're bummed, you know? So okay. that's probably okay. what I see happen often. Oh, oh man, this is funny. Okay, I, I want to share two things real quick. Um, and this, okay. everything you just mentioned right now, just click back to me when I first started as an SDR at Berk Street Systems 2018, about almost two years ago. I remember this one. So Berk Street, they provide this uh, e-procurement platform for like hotel and hotel management companies. So you can buy good services, ping, pay, whatever. And I remember I okay. couldn't find this. It, I looked on this guy's link there. I couldn't find him anywhere on the web. And I was fairly new. And the subject headline was the college that he went to. And, um, you know, you open up yeah. the message, just like trying to sell the message was wrong to it. Just try to sell the product. And he got pissed and he's like responding, Hey, why is the subject line the college I went to? And this has nothing to do with it. Da, da, da. Uh, that's number one. And I think another good example when I was they were fairly new there too, as well. So I, I, I look at the, their hotel management company. Right. And then I look at the hotels that they're managing. And then I was trying to think outside the box, try to be like a cool SDR to personalize, right? So you know what I did? I yeah. literally went to Yelp and typed in that hotel and looked up the hotel that had bad reviews. I would copy and paste those bad reviews and I would send it to that guy and say, hey, this is one of the hotels you're doing is the bad, bad reviews. Typically, this, uh, this person is complaining because you guys didn't have this on stock. Normally, when that happened, you guys don't have a solution in place. And this is what we do. <laughs> No response whatsoever. <laughs> and I think that, that would yeah. tie to what you were mentioning, right? Like you're just over personalized. It's not going anywhere. <laughs> well, yeah. And it, you know, maybe that was the right thing to do. Like that's so all of the oh, stuff man. you need to try for yourself. But I, a lot of times the, the advice that's given to SDRs is great advice, but, and the person giving the advice is totally in the right. They're giving a cool thing that works for them, but no one's telling you to stop doing the fundamentals. And that's where oh, I think people get a little mixed God. up oh, is because they see all of this advice on LinkedIn. They're reading all these different tricks and hacks and all this cool stuff. And they're putting a lot of energy into there, but the people giving the advice never said to stop the fundamentals, still make your calls, still send your emails in traditional way. Don't rip and replace, just experiment a little bit, start implementing this into your emails or into your cold calls. See, see if it works. Uh, so I think that's part of it, but um, I mean, there's a, the classic one is what the three by three, like three, find three things oh. in three minutes. Like, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. a good rule. 
if you're spending only three minutes, now you can, you can send a lot of emails that way, but if you're, but that's, people aren't following it. They're spending a lot of time. And I, and I think there's a point of diminishing return. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. You know, it's funny that three by three, everyone heard of that. <laughs> yeah. But they love to ignore it. The yeah. truth is it's, it's like a lot, like it's a lot easier to get kind of bogged down doing research than it is to pick up the phone and say, Hey, it's Kyle. <laughs> There's the comedy right there. You. <laughs> Kyle, so, so just before we start wrapping this up real quick. So when it comes for you as, as an SDR leader, um, let's say fresh kid out of school. I just graduated. You know what? Screw this. I don't want to be a doctor. I don't want to be a lawyer. I'm going to go into tech sales. What do you look for into when it comes to hiring a success, successful SDR and BDR? First, I sit them down and say, you sure you don't want to be a doctor? I spent a lot of time <laughs> doing that. <laughs> You might want to consider it. Um, I mean, the truth is, the truth is no one talks about it, but doctor lawyers, I mean, I know salespeople, I know a lot of salespeople who make more than the average doctor and the average lawyer. So um, yeah. it's not a bad career path by any means, but what advice do I give to a brand new SDR? Somebody who's, hey, I'm trying to get a job. I've never been SDR before. A couple of things. One is discipline. You have to be disciplined. Get in early leave late, figure it out, make the calls, change things if you have to, sound good on the phone, and become very good. And then when you're at a point to where you don't need to work 12 hours in order to hit your number, then implement a little life back into your work and have that work-life balance. But if you're a brand new SDR, you need to figure out how to do the job. And I mean, if you're at, like, I've been asked a ton of times, like, what's work-life balance at your company Like, when I'm interviewing? It's like, okay. I mean, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, honestly, like, we have, a, a, we have a pretty good work-life balance, but the, the problem is the spirit of the question. It's, I, and I believe, I want to preface this, I believe that having work-life balance is incredibly important, but it doesn't mean everybody has the luxury in the moment to have work-life balance. You need to figure out how to do the job really well. There's a learning curve. It's hard. It's gonna put you in uncomfortable positions. And if you don't work through that, then you're not gonna make it as an SDR or as a salesperson or as anything really. So what I would originally tell people is like, stop with anything else other than, let me get really good at this. Consume content learn the product, learn how the people who are booking the most meetings are doing it and replicate it, and then start worrying about all of these external stuff. But I hear oh way too God. much people worried about things that are outside of becoming the best possible SDR. Yes. Okay. I, that was like music to my ears. I know exactly what you're talking about because I went through that too when I first started. And what really, when we, this is, like you mentioned, this is a art, it's like an arts and craft project, right? It's like practicing personal development, getting better each and every day, sure. asking for feedback, knowing what to do, when to do. But for when it comes to this gig, you really shouldn't be worrying about work-life balance because you really got to get it down and you only have a specific time frame to do so. But it's just a, it's just a mountain that you got to overcome. And once you overcome it, then, you know, things will start looking like a little brighter and then work-life balance. And once you get good so to speak but you really gotta get there before you can it's like it's like you know just, it's, it's, it's an, I would say it's an obstacle you would have to overcome before you achieve some light at the end of the tunnel yeah there's always an obstacle it's always tough I mean I write I write a, an example in my book it's pretty early on <clears throat> um, you might remember it but I I had an experience when I was an SDR where it, it, I was, and I'll tell the short version I write about in the book. It's, it's, um, I think it makes a really strong point. And I, I essentially was in a position where it looked like I wasn't going to hit my number and I needed to in order to get promoted. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is impossible. And I had a full on panic attack. So the first and only panic attack I've ever had. And I don't have panic attacks. I'm pretty, I'm pretty intense, but I totally broke down. I was crying. I was in the stairwell of the building, like just totally a wreck. I couldn't even breathe. I was like, I don't know oh, if you had wow. a panic attack, but it's like, it's a pretty, it's both a physical and a mental experience. And it's pretty bad. Um, and 
what I, where I was, was I was in a position where what I needed to achieve seemed unachievable. And I was coming to grips with the fact that <clears throat> I, I was in a position where I have two options. I can either A, give 100% effort and risk failing, or B, give 50% effort. I'm guaranteed to fail with option B, but at least I protect my ego because I didn't actually try, right? Like failing is a lot worse when you were trying really hard and you failed. Well, it's very, very common in the world of sales development because sales is, has its ups and its downs. It's very, very common when things get incredibly tough to step off the gas and you guarantee failure in that case. Wow. But you have two options. Option A, give 100% risk failing. And if you fail, at least you gave it your all. But there's that small chance that you might not fail and you might just push through. I'll take that small chance of success over guaranteed failure every single day and everyone should but not everyone will wow okay yes 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 that I, that was the price of admission right there thank you for sharing that kyle i love that story <laughs> He's at the and, end yeah and you know what that 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 just tells us who you really are right because there are those who just stops in the middle of the road said you know what screw this fuck this man i'm out i'm gonna start applying around yep. or whatever and but there are those who yep. just go you know what I'm going to go down swinging. I'm not going to let this get back to me. I'm going to go all out. I'm going to go all in. And if I don't get it, hey, at least I knew I did my best rather than just giving up early on in the process. And that's exactly what you did. Man. Yeah. I mean, another, another anecdote I can leave you with is um, <clears throat> there's something my dad was really big on. And this is where I get this from. I think I spoke about it on David's podcast as well. But there's this concept of now what? Now what? So what the, the story for me is if I had some challenges and there were um, adversities, I would go to my dad and say, hey, I can't, I can't achieve X because of A, B, and C. And he would argue with me saying, yeah, you can. Just keep working, keep do, you know, put the effort in, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm like, no, you don't understand A, B, and C. And he's like, I don't think that's true. And I'm like, no, it is true. You, they're out to get me, whatever it is, right? And my dad, <laughs> my dad would say, okay, let's say you're right. Let's say everything, A, B, and C, let's say all of that is true. Now what? Wow. And that's a powerful statement. And it didn't hit me until I was much older, right? But yeah. it's pretty powerful because no matter what obstacles you have, like you have to do something. Now what? Okay, well, I, well let me problem solve. Let me figure out how to get over the obstacle. Um, as opposed to just throwing up your hands and throwing in the towel. Like, that's crazy to me. Like, isn't it crazy to like meet something that's a little tough and just go, all right, well, it was a good run. <laughs> right. Doesn't it just seem nuts? So like, I'd much rather push through and overcome the obstacle. I'd rather ask myself now what answer the question and then execute on the new solution. Yeah. Wow. Kyle, Thank you for sharing that. This was really super irrelevant, especially to now, every, once a year when the new generation graduates, graduates and jumps into tech and sales role because, and you know, I might get a little heat for this and I'm not saying it's for everybody, but majority of them got things like, oh, they're like spoiled, things were handed to you, they never had to get these obstacles. And once they hit this one little obstacle, it's like, oh man, fuck this, I'm out. Or like, you know, they do a code con and then they catch someone at the wrong time. Maybe they're calling SMBs and I'm experiencing this when SMBs are more toned to uh, throw you across the wall when it comes to picking up the phone. And if you're doing it wrong, they're like, ah, oh, you know what? Screw you, Kyle. Stop calling me and just hang up. And they're yep. just like, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm done with the phone. I'm going to go crawl on in the fetus and I'll just cry like a little baby. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you're, you're right. It is, it is tough. And um, look, you never know how someone's going to react when they hit those types of situations. When you're hiring, you try to hire the right people, but you're not always right. You know, some companies, they have a, uh, maybe being aggressive by using the word philosophy, but their strategy is we'll hire and see who sticks, right? And they expect a really high turnover in their SDR organization because of it, um, which is fine. It's a strategy. You know, it's, it, it definitely, there's pros and cons to everything. Um, 
I tried to do a little bit more on the front end on the hiring side and tried to do my best to enable my team to be as successful as possible. Um, but I get it. If you're hiring a lot of SDRs, you have to expect a certain level of turnover. Um, so you never know what someone's going to do is the point. Uh, and always, all you can control is what you do. And I try to s s look at myself and say, if I do everything I can and I'm truly happy with how I train these people or how I uh, mentored them, then I'm in a good place. Doesn't mean there's not, there wasn't anything I could learn from the experience or absolutely is, but I'm in a good place. I know I did the right thing. And I, and I think that's, that's um, a good mentality to have. Focus on yourself and do the best you can do. Hold yourself to a standard. Learn when things happen, improve. But at the end of the day, like don't compromise on your own standard. Wow. Okay. I love that right there. It's just like what Jim Rohn says. You know, he says one of his um, famous quote unquote is if you want things to change, you have to change. Yep. And man, that was, that was amazing. All right. So Kyle, just to wrap things up here, you know, on, man, I'm just so thankful for you to copy on. This is uh, truly amazing for me. Is there anyone you got to give special thanks to? And if there's someone on the pod listening right now, want to reach out to you, Kyle, I read your blog. I've got your book. I want to say thank you. What's the best way to do so? Just reach out to me on uh, LinkedIn. I'll, you know, send me a connection request. I'll, I'll accept you. Um, <laughs> you can email me. Everyone has a tool to find my email. You can cold call me. That'd be the dream. If you cold call me, then I'm the happiest person. One of my biggest pet peeves is when people email me saying, hey, I gave you a call earlier today. And I know they didn't because I know I didn't get a call. <laughs> Like, I hate that. I absolutely hate that. I'll, I literally respond, no, you didn't. <laughs> Next. <laughs> so, so cold call me. Dude, whatever you want to do. I'm um, um, happy to chat. Happy to provide oh any value God. I can. Okay, for sure. You know, I just want to end this with a uh, quick story, too. It's funny that you mentioned that because um, you're, you're familiar with um, James Thornburg, right? 27 second guy? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's funny. You know, I actually cold called him about uh, two months ago to ask him to come on a pod. I was like, hey, man, I have 27 seconds of time. Explain reason for my call. He's like, go ahead. I was like, yeah, you know, I, was, I do this podcast. I love your stuff. I was wanting to be open to it. He's like, no, nah, no, nah, don't call me. Man. They're in the wrong time, whatever. But um, yeah, that's. <laughs> All right, guys, without further ado, uh, we'd like to go ahead and thank you again, Mr. Kyle Van Boris. That's me. Thanks, guys. It was fun.